Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Welcome to the first webinar of the Four Corners Lecture Series. This talk is jointly sponsored by the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center and the Hisatsunum Chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society. We're really pleased to present Dr. Kellum Throgmorton, who will be discussing the political power of landscape change in the Chacoan world. Kellum is the supervisory archaeologist at Crow Canyon, and he received his PhD from Binghamton University in 2019. Over the last 11 years, he's conducted research and fieldwork at numerous Chaco and outlier sites in the greater Four Corners. And he recently learned that he was the recipient of the Binghamton University Distinguished Dissertation Award. And all of you lucky listeners out there will get to hear about the research, that research in Kellum's talk tonight. We want this to be as interactive as possible, so please submit questions. If you're watching on Zoom, you should see a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A, where you can type in questions. If you're watching on Facebook Live, type in questions in the comments box. I'll be your moderator tonight. Oh, and I'm Carrie Schler, by the way. And I will ask as many of your questions as we can in the time that we have allotted. Kellum has done a really great thing for us for this webinar, where there's gonna be a question and answer session after each section of his talk. So he's divided it into about four different sections. We'll also do a Q&A session at the end. Those little ones in between after each section will probably be pretty short. We'll definitely try to keep them to less than five minutes so that we're not here you know, for three hours. Um, and uh, we'll also have what, whatever time we have left at the end to do all the rest of your questions. Now, over 300 people have signed up for the webinar. So there's no pressure here, uh, Kellum at all. Um, so we will try to get to all your questions, but we not, might not be able to get to everyone, but we'll certainly make uh, our best efforts. All right, so let's go ahead and let Kellum take it away. All right, well, let me get my, let me get the screen shared here. And hopefully you all ought to be able to see that. <clears throat> hopefully not too much saying my internet's unstable. Anyway, I, I now know what it feels like to be Kai Rizdahl, where you're just sort of talking and you can't see the audience. Um, so I'm just going to keep rolling with that. Um, so and thank you for the introduction, Carrie. Uh, as she said, this talk is about the political power of landscape change in the Chocolate world. It is the outcome of my dissertation research over the last couple of years, and a little bit of stuff added in beyond that. Screen moving forward. There we go. So the way this is going to work, there's going to be, as Carrie said, a couple of sections. I'm going to talk about Chaco, some general information, because I'm not, you know, normally this is the part of the talk where I say, raise your hand if you've heard of Chaco Canyon. Um, go ahead and raise it, uh, but I, I'm not going to be able to see it. So I'm going to kind of shoot down the middle and assume we've got a general level of knowledge here. Uh, I'm going to talk about some theoretical concepts surrounding uh, the anthropology of, of states, of archaic states, and introduce a concept called peoplehood. And there'll be a Q&A after that. I'm going to talk about landscapes, landscapes in general, and landscapes specifically in the U.S. Southwest. There'll be another Q&A after that. Uh, I then we'll go into a section to talk about the history of Chaco to give you sort of the background. I'm a big proponent of if you really want to understand something, uh, you need to know how it came to be. Uh, and so I'll give that history and there'll be a real brief Q&A then. That might be a good spot for real general Chaco questions if you didn't get them done in the first section. Uh, and then the final bit, I'm going to run right through those last two parts uh, where I compare two communities as case studies and move right into some of tying all of this together. Uh, and, and trying to tie together the big ideas about Chaco uh, and political complexity in the, uh, in the ancestral Pueblo past. But first, um, this is going to be a little bit odd, but I got to give you an analogy. I think a lot from analogies. Uh, and so this is my analogy. Uh, the world as we know it, it's like a knotted ball of yarn, like a tangled ball of yarn. And what social science tries to do uh, is it tries to unravel that yarn figure out all those little knots, pull them apart, 
and then put it back together again and make something of it. So we're basically pulling things apart in specific ways and trying to put them back together again uh, so we can see the whole. Now, when you unravel yarn, you find knots. And all those knots are the thorny problems, the social issues, the questions that social science deals with. And when you pull on those threads, you begin to see how they're all connected. You pull on this knot and it turns out that, you know, migration over here is tied to food stress and climate change over here. And there's interesting ways they're tied together. Um, some of these knots will pull on the, you know, the whole ball of yarn. Others are pretty loosely wrapped and not connected to things. So these threads are the relations that make up the world we live in. So if the goal is to ultimately make something out of this knotted ball of thread, like you're trying to make a sweater, uh, you're going to want to pick your way through those knots pretty carefully. If you just take some scissors to it, uh, you're ultimately going to have a bunch of disjointed threads. They won't go back together again. You'll never get a sweater out of that. Um, but if you pick the right tools, in this case a knitting needle, you'll be able to tease the ball apart and get all those threads all, all untangled, unknotted into one long piece. Um, you work your way back from one end to the last. And that's thinking historically, pulling these problems apart using historical thinking. The end goal then is to put it all back together again and try to understand it. So I just throw that analogy out there because it really does form the foundation for how I approach these questions. Uh, and I'll make reference to it saying like, here's where we are in the, uh, in the knotted ball of yarn analogy as we're moving forward. Okay, with that out of the way, uh, I wanna move on to talking a bit about Chaco. So what is Chaco? Archaeologists have been working in Chaco since the 1880s and the 1890s. Um, Native Americans uh, living in the southwest have known about it all along, of course, uh, and it figures into their histories and ceremonies. And I guess I'll preface this talk by saying uh, I'm, what I'm going to be speaking about is pretty archaeological in nature. It presents a version of events, of issues, uh, and research questions that reflect predominantly Western ways of knowing about Chaco. There are other equally valid ways. This is uh, just a social science way of approaching it. Uh, in short, Chaco is a pattern that is defined by ar archaeologists, but it's a reflection of real events and processes that occurred between about 850 and 1140 uh, in the northern southwest. Uh, at the heart of Chaco uh, lies Chaco Canyon, and I've got a photo of it here. Um, I, I picked a bunch of pictures from the southwest, and they all seem to have clouds and rain, so I'm really trying to like make the point that it does occasionally rain here, and these are not entirely arid places. Um, but this photo shows you downtown Chaco Canyon. Um, you can see several great houses in it. It's, um, it's one of the densest collections of major buildings and landscape features uh, and agricultural features anywhere in the Southwest. Um, when we zoom in on it a little bit and we begin looking, um, we, we can see what some of the buildings are. And, and this is really what drew people's attention to it. So here's a picture of the so-called Chetro Kettle Colonnade. Uh, it gives you a sense of the kind of buildings that really typify uh, the construction that goes on in, that went on in Chaco Canyon. Um, there's a suite of masonry technologies, uh, there's construction techniques, uh, and layouts of these buildings that serve to differentiate Chaco style construction from other more vernacular ways of building houses in the same time period. So we call these big ones great houses uh, to differentiate them from the smaller houses that, that existed in, in the ancestral Pueblo world at the same time. Now, Chaco is not just buildings. Um, if you'd seen our talk uh, that Carrie and I gave a few weeks ago, uh, we went into more detail on some of the objects. Uh, we went into some detail on the uh, on the, you know, the, the pottery that comes in, the lithic material that's traded in, uh, the timbers to build the roofs on these great houses came from mountain ranges that are 40, 60 miles away. Uh, Chaco and elites were bringing in things like macaw feathers, actual macaws, copper bells, cacao, uh, and they were, uh, these were all coming up from places in Western Mexico and Central Mexico. Um, so, so Chaco is a, is a place characterized um, not just by these big buildings, but also by the objects that were found in those buildings and the practices we associate with those objects. Now, there's a dozen or more good candidate great houses in Chaco Canyon, uh, and there's several more within an area we call the Chaco and Core. It's a 20 mile area that surrounds Chaco Canyon. Um, so this core area extends about 20 miles around, and it's a place that shares a similar history. This is a picture of Kin Biniola, just to give you an idea that, yes, there's big great houses uh, not in Chaco Canyon as well. And some of the largest actually are found in this area, about 20 miles around Chaco Canyon. 
Now, one of the key features that I pay attention to uh, with, with Chaco, and I think is an important way to define it as well, uh, are the landscapes. So that is the ways that people put together uh, their, their, their built environment and how to interact with the existing physical environment. Uh, and so we'll see things like roads, trails, uh, stone circles, cairns, um, earthen berms. There's none visible in this photo, but in Chaco, they'll often build these massive berms that sort of surround grade houses and create this uh, sort of a, uh, an, an exterior versus an interior space, a kind of, um, uh, some people talk about it as being, you know, sanctified space on the inside and, and more uh, vernacular or quotidian space on the other side. Um, so these features all combine to make aspects of the Chacoan landscape. Um, now, I also tend to include community layouts, uh, things that people might call settlement patterns, uh, because they are people uh, using the built environment to interact with the physical environment. I actually see these as being an important way to think about uh, landscape as well. And you'll see that in my work as we get closer to the, the end of this talk. Now, um, my advisor, uh, Dr. Ruth Van Dyke, argues that all of these features I'm showing you are part of a Chacoan landscape ideology uh, that included principles of dualism, balance, symmetry, uh, as well as references to movement, memory, and visibility. And so I like this photo here, which actually encompasses a lot of those where you've got a stone circle uh, that is at a position where you can really frame the, the, the South Gap heading out of Chaco Canyon. You can see a prominent butte, Hosta Butte on the horizon. There are road segments heading there. Uh, this ties together a lot of aspects of those Chaco and landscapes in one photo. Now, um, Chaco is more than buildings. It's more than just the things in Chaco Canyon. It's a pattern in the cultural geography of the U.S. Southwest. Uh, during the 11th and early 12th century, Chaco was a major cultural and political center. Uh, ancestral Pueblo communities across the northern third of the U.S. Southwest show evidence of Chaco and influence, and you can kind of see the extent of that shown here. Now, this is a big region. Um, it's about 25,000 square miles, which is roughly the size of New England. Um, although New England is a little bit smaller than I once thought when I moved out to New York to go to graduate school. I moved upstate New York, thought I was moving to New England, spent about three weeks in blissful ignorance of that. And then everybody said like, dude, you just moved to the Northeast. You're not in New England yet. It's over there in Boston. Um, anyway, this area, it's, it, it's a vast area when you put it in East Coast standards. Now, within that area, the reason we consider that the extent of like the Chaco and cultural geography is that we find these sites called outliers uh, within it. Um, there's 200 plus communities that have either great house architecture or Chaco and landscape features uh, that would make us think that, uh, that they have some kind of a relationship with Chaco Canyon. So I've got a, a photo of one here. This is the Andrews Great House. Um, it's south of Chaco Canyon. Um, Here's one with some standing masonry. This is Kenya'a, uh, which is not too far outside of Chaco Canyon. Uh, and so these outliers have been, a, uh, were, were really came on the radar screen for archeologists in, the, in the, the middle 1970s. And at that point, people's opinion of Chaco really changed from being, is it a small, dense, important center in, in Chaco Canyon that has some influences from perhaps as far away as Mexico to, wait a minute, is this the center of some really massive thing that, 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 that stretches basically from uh, Kemado, New Mexico, all the way up to Blanding, Utah? Uh, that's, that's about, well, I wanna say two or three, 300, 200 miles across. So that really leads us right into a uh, conversation about how anthropologists um, think about states. Uh, so with the outlier debate, uh, or with, with the idea of outliers in Chaco, um, archaeologists really begin to think about the relationship of cores to peripheries. We have all these outliers, and then we've got Chaco Canyon. Um, are the outliers a result of local emulation? Or are they a result of Chaco and export, of actual Chacoans coming and building these? If they're emulations, uh, then the political importance of the pattern is somewhat diminished. It's sort of, well, everybody's doing this. It couldn't have been, you know, there's not like somebody directing traffic at the center. But if these are exports, if Chacoans are going out and building buildings that look like the things they make in Chaco Canyon, um, Chaco would be a lot bigger, um, a lot more complex to use the anthropological term. And so, so we're paying attention to outliers in the 90s and to this complexity question. Um, but we got a little sidetracked. We learned a lot of great stuff. We learned a lot of stuff about architecture. Um, we learned a lot of stuff about practice. But the core question remained, what kind of political entity was Chaco? And that's really what I'm trying to get at uh, in this talk. 
So when we think about complexity and political complexity, that's a way of saying, what kind of organization did you have? Was it um, you know, non-hierarchical, and we're talking about 500 people, or is it very hierarchical, like the, uh, the contemporary United States, where we've got millions of people, and, and there's leaders, and there's um, folks who, who there's sort of a hierarchy of how we make decisions. Um, that is a very anthropological way of thinking about states and political complexity. Um, and so I think that there's a few key things here that, that maybe are, we, we've gotten wrong uh, in terms of how anthropology thinks about states. Um, the first is this notion of social evolution. So the idea of the state uh, in anthropological theory was that you'd have kind of like, you know, bands and tribes of small groups of people, and then you might have a leader and they control some territory and they might be a chief. And then you'll have kings and emperors and folks who control states and there's bureaucracies and there's tax systems and there's standing armies. Um, it was framed in terms of social and cultural evolution, that humankind was evolving from something um, simple to something more complex. And so you can see why I kind of use scare quotes when I talk about complexity. Um, but I think this is a misapplication of analogy. So, so think of this, like we think of the human body as a system with separate parts that function in certain ways. You know, when something's feeling out of whack, you go to the doctor, you have it looked at and they say, well, you're, you're, you, you know, you got your kidneys not functioning properly. Um, it's this very mechanistic kind of analogy. Well, that's exactly the same way we think about cars. You know, your car's out of, out of whack. There's something wrong with the alternator. You take it in, it gets diagnosed, you repair it. Um, you put the part back in and it goes back to functioning. We're using this analogy to think about cars and bodies, but cars and bodies are obviously totally different. Um, so I think the same thing is that we're thinking about societies and cultures in terms of evolution, um, and that that's a misapplication of the analogy. We also think as being about the controlled flow of goods, of information, of services, um, and having laws and bureaucracies that sort of govern how people can do things. Um, in, in essence, we've defined what a state is or a level of political complexity based solely on the economy. Uh, not on ideologies, not on shared practices or beliefs about the world, but on a series of things that we can just measure uh, about economies. So I thought, if I want to know what it is that makes a sovereign state, um, a group of people unified by abstract principles, by concrete practices, by histories, where would I turn to get a better sense uh, in, in working in Native North America, where would I turn to get a better sense of like, how do we talk about political complexity uh, in, in this world? And to do that, I actually turned to the indigenous sovereignty movement. Um, through the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and today, uh, indigenous scholars have sought to explain how do native peoples maintain um, identities as that are separate from the, the nation state, say, say separate from the United States, yet they are still a political group of people. They have a shared identity, they have shared practices, they have a shared political cause. How do we talk about them as being like a real group of people somehow existing in within, but sort of alongside the confines of the nation state? Well, uh, a series, some scholars, uh, Tom Holm, I believe at U of A, um, came up with this idea of peoplehood. And it's essentially an indigenous model for uh, political organization. And what it does is it takes as its starting point, um, the notion of relations. It really, it, it looks at four things and says there's four key pillars to a group of people. Um, there's landscapes, there's history, there's language, and there's ceremonies. And this is, these are the things that uh, Native American scholars and political scientists say, if we want to talk about how we are a group of people, this is what we're going to use. Um, all of these pillars are, are entwined. You know, if you're, it's, it's like the ball of yarn again, where I'm pulling on landscape, uh, it's actually connected to history because the landscapes have, uh, you know, mnemonic devices that talk about, and here's when we lived over here, and here's when people moved over here. There are ceremonies that reference those histories. The places uh, are, are known with particular toponyms that are in, in particular languages, um, and they help explain the histories. And so you can see how you tug on any one of these you're actually talking about uh, all the other three at any given moment. Um, so I really, I find that I really like um, peoplehood as a, a way of thinking about political organization. Um, 
What's great about it is it, it's, um, first of all, it's rooted in indigenous political science. If we're working with native peoples and the history of native peoples in the Southwest, um, it makes sense to me to turn to Native American scholars and political scientists. Um, I also like that its point is it's looking for things that aren't necessarily part, just parts of contemporary nation states, like the economies that um, most anthropological theories of the state rely on. It's not a checklist. It's not saying like, well, they got a standing army. There's this kind of thing. This is what makes a people. It's actually about the relationships between people and places uh, and people and things and people and other people. Uh, I think it escapes this trap of talking only about economies and it directs our attention to different things, especially um, landscapes. Um, and that is going to be sort of my, my launching point for the rest of this to say, um, I like uh, uh, peoplehood says maybe we should stop measuring certain things in archaeology uh, and, and turn our attention to different parts of the material record uh, of history, particularly landscape, and that landscape can be a part of a way to define um, a political entity of some stripe or another. Um, in my ball of yarn analogy, peoplehood is kind of like the knitting needles and anthropological theories of the state are like scissors. I think if we're going to try to pull Chaco apart and talk about how all the parts are working and where they intersect and then put it back together again, well, we want to be able to actually get it back together again. And so I feel like I want to use the knitting needle instead of the scissors uh, in this case. So, so I've used peoplehood as my launching point, which actually brings us to our first Q&A session. So I, I don't know if we've got any questions coming up yet, Carrie, um, about sort of that introductory bit there. But if you've got any, I'd be happy to take them. Great, Kellen. We have just one question so far, and it's a little bit about the earlier Chaco uh, part of the presentation, uh, Chaco background part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what did people do in the great houses? Are they family homes or public spaces? What's your thoughts on that? Okay, so I, I did kind of gloss through, you know, the great houses and partly because there's a lot of debate over that. My thinking on it is that most of them served as elite residences. And I've got a longer series of arguments that brings this historically from their beginnings to what we see uh, in the archaeological record in Chaco. But my feeling is that much like... Um, well, you know, I think about it like uh, like trailer courts and, and McMansions. People take up different space depending on their social class. Um, and so with great houses, there's a tendency to either see them as entirely empty and it's, uh, you know, priestly elites and the rooms are barely being used for anything. They're all about space or that it's, um, you know, that they're crammed full of people and they're really not dramatically different than contemporary Pueblo apartment style buildings. I kind of take a middle ground and I say, well, elites tend to take up more space. You know, that's, that's one of the things that we see cross-culturally. And so for me, they're very big. They're meant to send a message. Um, they encode certain kinds of information about what the people living in them knew. Um, so I see them as residences um, of elite families and probably some retainers and hanger-ons and the kind of things that elite families have with them typically. Um, so that's all I'm thinking about great houses. Great. We have a number actually now there's like six more questions. So I'll, I'll just pick, I'll just go down the list here. Yeah, um, I got time for I think let's take two more, I think. Okay, so. okay. Uh, this one is interesting and it addresses or your question or the issue of peoplehood. Mm -hmm. um, this individual would like to know out of the four parts of peoplehood, do you have one that you think is more critical? So if you read the authors and, and the, the native scholars who are working with this idea, most folks argue that none is meant to be more critical than another, um, that they all mutually support each other. Uh, I personally have drawn on landscape quite a bit. I think for archaeologists, it's great because it's something that we can record, we can see it, we can measure it, and it gives us a little bit of access, as I said, through that, you know, tangled knots of string analogy, it gives us some access to both history and ceremony. Um, language is really tricky for archaeologists to get to. Not impossible, but it's definitely tricky. Um, so for me, I tend to focus on landscape, but I don't think that any one of them is any part of it in terms of defining a group of people is more important than another. It's my entry point, landscape. Okay, great. Um, oh, there's a lot, there's a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, do, do you have an archeological definition of landscape? Like how would you define a landscape? 
I do, and we'll get to that in the next section. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> I can take one more. I'll take one more then, since I know I'm going to toss that one back at them. Uh, okay. Oh my gosh. Um, this might be a longer question, but uh, what do you look for in the material culture to support the peoplehood model? Okay, what do I look for in the material culture to support the peoplehood model? Um, one of the big things, and I'll circle back to this at the end, but something that really blew my mind has been in Chaco and archeology, span there is precious little evidence there's not a lot of evidence of Chacoan, Chacoan intervention in a community having much of an impact on the economies. We don't see dramatic changes where like surplus from the Northern San Juan region, Southwest Colorado being directed towards Chaco. We don't see a lot of evidence that people's ceramic production practices change remarkably with um, the appearance of a great house or great house style architecture. And so for me, I was like, these are the things we spend a lot of time as archaeologists looking at. Um, when I shifted away from looking at those kinds of material culture and towards looking at things like landscape and settlement patterns, um, I began to see a lot of ways in which Chaco looked different to me. Now, I know that's not like a hypothetical deductive kind of way of looking at it, but um, I think some of this may become clear as I, I continue further in the talk too. So. Um, and I guess with the rest of these questions, I mean, I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. We typically try to keep a little register of these things and, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to get to them, you know, at some point in some fashion. So there was already a bit of a question about landscape. Um, and so I'm going to turn to that right now. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just differentiate land from landscape. They're not the same thing. Um, it's tempting to think about landscape as just being bigger, broader, the landscapes of the American West, these massive, you know, these big vistas and, and uh, things like that. But ultimately, the distinction I'm looking at is land is quantitative. It's a way that we categorize space, we partition space. It's sort of our objective way of parceling things out into acres. Um, it's ways of measuring productivity. Um, it's, it's a quantitative approach. Landscape uh, is qualitative. It's how places are experienced. Um, it's social. Uh, it's how people move through places. It's their relationships with places. It's a very subjective kind of way of looking at things. Um, you know, when you think about landscapes, they're, well, land is about boundaries and landscapes are about connections. You know, I guess that's kind of one of the ways I really look at it. I'm taking this connection approach. So it's how our how, it, how is built feature connecting to places in the landscape? How is it meant to connect people to a landform, people to a particular practice or ceremony? Um, so that's where I, and, 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 and that, that I guess that would be sort of my definition on landscape. And I can go into greater detail on this at some point. Um, but for now, I'm working with the idea that it's this qualitative experienced way of approaching a place. So, one of the ways I actually wanted to get to this um, is talking about the relationship between people and landscapes. And so it's, it's this idea of relational identities. Um, and I wanted to explain this. The underlying theories here come from a variety of folks like uh, Vine Deloria, Lloyd Lee, Soren Larson, Sev Fowles, Deborah Bird Rose, and Ruth Van Dyke. Um, but I, I'm going to kind of phrase it up in this quick little analogy to get us thinking about relational identities. We all know someone who has a pet that defines them, uh, right? Uh, like every Instagram post they have is about their cat, their dog, their parrot, or what have you. Um, the extent that it's just, it's impossible to think about them without also considering their pet. Um, and in that way, if we took the pet away, they would not be the same person. And similarly, if we took the person away from the pet, it would not be the same animal. Their identities and existences are completely entwined. Um, you know, in a way, a piece of the person is found in the dog and, and, and vice versa. And I got this photo up here um, of, of someone I know who, who made me think of this analogy. Um, that idea where you're like, yeah, I, can, I can't really think of this person without that part of them, that exterior, uh, exteriorization of their identity into this object. Well, let's think of that in terms of landscapes. Let's push that from pets and say, well, what about places having that kind of effect on people? Um, so, you know, there's, it's these relationships that exist between people and landscapes, and that's all the parts of these landscapes. And we've got a whole host here. 
Um, you know, we've got the, the minerals, the animals, the rocks, the rivers, the springs, topographic. Um, and imagine that a piece of a person is found in each of those. Um, that all these things comp together comprise that person. If you take away some of those plants or those springs, they're not going to be the same person. If you take away the people, uh, the springs are going to be different. They're going to interact with other people out there, different groups of people. Um, this idea really uh, can be summed up in a nice pithy phrase that Seb Fowles uh, quipped, which is change the land, change the people. Uh, you know, if the people in the landscape are that connected and their identities, their subjectivities are invested in those places, um, when you're changing those places, you're also having a dramatic effect on the people and not just in the sense of, oh, it's a shame that they, uh, you know, uh, paved over that, that farmer's field and put up a Walmart. I mean, this is really at the core of who a group of people is. Go back to that peoplehood analogy where we're saying what it means to exist as a group of people, sovereign from all others, um, when you're messing with the landscape part, you are really messing with the people part. Um, well, so let's talk a little bit about landscapes in the Southwest. I think we can define, um, and this is sort of where I've like, maybe in the ball of yarn analogy, I'm getting down to like, okay, here's how I actually go about picking the knots apart. Some people do it one way, other people do it another way. Um, this is me coming up with a methodology for picking apart the knot of landscape specific to the US Southwest. Um, now, if you give a close read to the uh, ethnographic literature, um, there, there are, I think you can define two different ways of looking at landscape. One I'm going to call localizing landscapes. Uh, and this is drawing a lot on Eastern Pueblo ethnography. Um, and we probably, we have to, you know, this a lot comes from the work of Ortiz, uh, who published a seminal sort of um, structuralist look at the, the at Eastern Pueblo Tewa cosmology. Um, but the way it's is described is, is these nested concentric triads with corresponding landscapes. There's a village, the village has village shrines that are kind of at the north, the south, the east, and the west of it. If you go out another level, you've got these important landscape features that might be springs, and they'll be in the cardinal directions, and springs are hills, and these are places where important deities might reside, um, or where, um, you know, where people go to access certain parts of the, the non-human world. Um, and you extend another level out and you've got sacred mountains that are in cardinal directions and they are to the north, the south, the east, the west. And these mountains sort of define the space for that specific village. So it's these nested triads where each uh, landscape level kind of corresponds to, um, you know, a, a different aspect of, of village life. Now, time in these places is really interesting. Uh, and there's been a lot of re research recently um, explaining this concept of emergence, that it's this idea that a person is continually, this landscape helps a person continually emerge into a present existence. Um, the places around them might be changing in subtle ways, but they are tacking along with that. Uh, and so the focus is on time as it is experienced in the present. The past uh, is manipulated, changed, and altered in the service of the present. Um, Part of this is achieved through an emphasis on symmetry, balance, and cyclical renewal. So there might be things like solstice markers where um, you know, village leadership roles might change at the winter solstice. Um, and we know that there's inequalities built in there, but they even out over this, this yearly uh, calendrical cycle. Um, the balance between a north and a south half of a village helps sort of bring people into, into a present existence. So I call these localizing landscapes. Now, uh, there has not been as much comprehensive uh, structuralist approaches to looking at the landscapes of the Western Pueblo, uh, but I argue that you can develop a, 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 an idea called historicizing landscapes based on the ethnographic uh, work there. And it is very directional and historical. Um, and a lot of this work is uh, pulling from Wes Bernardini's um, ethnograph ethnographic work, um, ethnological work too at, at Hopi. Um, the movement of ceremonies and fetishes is a critical part of understanding who a group of people are at any given moment. Um, and so they track the, mo the movement of those objects through different communities at different times. Uh, in essence, it's showing how wisdom and knowledge is revealed at particular places on the landscape. Uh, at different times. And who a group of people is at any given moment is, is really based on, well, what is the sum total of your experiences? 
and the directions and the places matter. It's not just like, you know, generically north is an important direction. It's like, well, you know, north might be important because that was the village we lived in before this one. Uh, and then before that, we lived over there. Um, time is really measured on the landscape. I mean, it's being able to stand in a place and say, today is here, uh, yesterday is just right over there, and the day before yesterday is, you know, two, two ridges over that way. Uh, time is really measured out in ways that it is not so much on uh, localizing landscapes. So there's a piece of me that kind of wishes I'd given these are these are tricky names localizing historicizing I, you know I might call them maybe emergent and sequential or something like that as well um, to to draw on the existing literature more. But to kind of sum this section up, um, I've gotten here by saying that people had suggest that landscapes have largely been left out of the consideration of political complexity in the U.S. Southwest. Um, it also suggests that a relational perspective, a relational perspective is key. Um, talking about landscapes at least partially pulls on the threads that are related to histories and ceremonies and languages. I chose landscape to, to get after this. And so we can see how from Native American ontological perspectives, landscapes are deeply entwined with people. When you change landscapes, you're changing people. Things that work in one place might not work in a different place. Um, the landscape is going to demand different things of the people living in it. They're going to morph a little bit into those, those places. This is very much at odds with the Euro-American way of looking at the world, uh, where universal ideas on religion, society, social progress, these things are transported and allowed to play out in various places around the globe. I mean, that's basically the story of colonialism for 400 years. Um, now, everyone has their way of picking apart a knot. Mine has been looking at how landscapes reflect different engagements with time, actually. And I didn't really go into great detail on that, but basically I'm trying to figure out, using archaeological field techniques, uh, do some communities have evidence of a cyclical relationship with time, or do some communities have a more linear or historically direct relationship with time? I guess you could boil it down to that. Um, the theory behind this is some serious, like, 3 a.m. college dorm room, smoke a J and listen to Hearts of Space kind of stuff. Um, but basically the idea I'm getting after is like, is it cyclical or is it a more historically direct relationship with time? Um, and there's, you know, the features that we might see to look for those, um, I'm, I'm going to get into as I discuss some of the history of specific Chacoan communities. But it is going to be, are there road segments? Are there shrines in particular places? What kinds of alignments are there? Do we see evidence for balanced dualism? Each of these are going to push me a different direction uh, as I look at a landscape to say, well, that one seems a bit more like the localizing landscapes. Whereas this one, you know, with its road segments and big emphasis on historical juxtapositions, that's going to give us more about, um, you know, the, the, the historicizing landscapes. So uh, this is another opportunity for some Q&A, and I'll, I'll try to address it as best I can if we've got anything coming in, Carrie. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to take a sip of water. We do. There's many questions. Let's see. Okay. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, oh I have a, this one is probably an easy one. If we want to learn more about this, what books or articles would you recommend reading? <laughs> Um, well, there, you know, my dissertation is a place to start, um, and that's where, that's, I, I think Crow Canyon has something up on their website that can direct you towards that, um, uh, it's up on academia. That's a stuffy document, um, just to warn you, I mean, I try to be a conversational writer, I'm no Steve Lexin, but, uh, it's, it's a place to start, and it's got the citations for all of this. Um, other places to go. There's been some great work by Ruth Van Dyke. James Sneed, Severn Fowles, um, from, from the archaeological perspective on landscapes. Wes Bernardini has done a lot with uh, Western Pueblo landscapes uh, and defining those. Who else? Uh, I want to say um, Robert Purcell has done some work as well. So there's other places to go for, for, for landscape studies, archaeological perspectives on landscape studies. Great. Okay. Where do you think animals in this four-part paradigm of peoplehood, especially given the innate personhood of some animals in native cultures? Do you think animals fit into that model? Yeah, I would see that. I mean, for me, they fall into landscape, but once again, a way to think about this, it's, it's tricky to get away from thinking where we're going 
well, where do animals go? We need to put them into, you know, either landscape or do we put them in ceremonies or where do we want to, you know, where or where are we going to, you know, put a relational way would say, well, animals can actually fall into all of these categories in various different ways. We're going to be talking about them differently if we talk about them from the perspective of landscape. We'll be talking about them differently if we're saying, well, let's do the linguistic aspects of, um, you know, how the importance of animals within native society. Um, so that's sort of how I would approach that and say, well, you know, they are in the natural world and they are a thing that people have relationships with. I'm viewing them through the lens of landscape. You could also view them through the lens of, of history. You could view them through the lens of, of language, of ceremony. It's a, just a different way of thinking about things. You just don't try to categorize them. We try to think of their relationships and how, those re how they will look different depending on where you are in the relationship. Great, thank you. Um, uh, this question is sort of a long question, but I think it has a relatively straightforward answer. So let me try to summarize it and not read the whole thing. Um, okay. So this, this person is interested in the trails and roads um, in landscape. And um, he or she is asking um, if there's a wrong north-south orientation of all of these various handmade elements or, or what the orientation is. What is the orientation? Okay, um, with roads, there are cardinal roads um, and there are some folks currently, uh, I want to give a shout out to Rob Weiner, who's a grad student at um, University of Colorado, who's doing more research on the roads in particular. Um, it was a hot topic back in the 80s and the early 90s. Uh, we really need to go out and spend more time documenting them, thinking about them, trying to understand, you know, there's probably different kinds of roads and you'll notice that I tend to treat them as sort of a unitary phenomenon and I know that's not entirely correct. Um, Yes, there are aspects to them. I think a lot of times though, they are actually pointing between um, places that are at different moments in time. That sometimes the roads are saying, this is before and this is after. This is a, you know, a Basket Maker 3 community. This is a Pueblo 2 community. We're gonna connect them with a road to show that this is where we came from in the past. Um, alignments, if you get even a bit more abstract and just go alignments, the difference between cardinality, solstitial, um, lunar, major, minor lunar standstills, these seem to be big things in Chaco. I wasn't really much of an archaeoastronomy nerd until I started doing my own field work and I started seeing some of these alignments for myself and went, wait a minute, the difference between a solstitial and a lunar standstill, that might have been, a, you know, in the model I'm developing, that could have been a really big change for the, like what it meant in the identity of a person in that community. Um, Cardinality uh, plays a role in that. Certain aspects of Chaco are clearly aligned in a cardinal fashion. Other parts, definitely not. That seems to be a, a part of the negotiations and the politics of setting up a community. So I think in the interest of time, we might want to move onward and might have to cache some of these questions for, for, for future use. Um, sure. Unless there's any like burning one that, you know, everybody's asking and I'm totally missing the point, Carrie. No, I think. I I think that's a great idea. We'll, we'll, we'll try to get to more of these at the end. All right. So, all right, where are we now? Um, I've argued that there are two discernible ways of constructing a landscape in the Pueblo world. I want to stress that they are not entirely mutually exclusive, that they are specific to the Pueblo world. Um, if you were going to do this in, I don't know, in North Africa or something, you'd probably come up with really different methods. These methods were tools I'm working. Um, if we can see, can we see these different kinds of landscapes in the past? Um, if we are using landscape to understand Chaco and political organization, there are certainly places we would want to look for answers, some places more than others. There are contrasts we'd want to pull out. Um, and this is where, when I say to understand what something is, you have to think about its history. Uh, it's going to give you guidance on where to go for answers. Um, I think a close examination of the history of the Northern Southwest is going to help. Going back to that ball of yarn analogy, uh, to unwind the knots, we have to do it in a certain order. We got to start from uh, one end and work our way to the other. And that, that's how you unwind a, a tangled ball of yarn. So I'm going to consider the historical trajectory of two related but distinct regions of the Northern Southwest. Uh, we call these the Northern San Juan and the San Juan Basin. Those are going to get 
um, a little bit confusing because they're similar terms, but it's basically Southwest Colorado uh, as opposed to the San Juan Basin, Chaco, uh, Northwest New Mexico. These are archaeologist conventions based on you know, similarities and cultural patterns like pottery and house construction technology, but they're roughly areas north and south of the San Juan River. Um, and so my focus is trying to find, look for contrasts so that we can actually look at these different kinds of, kinds of landscapes. So they've got distinct historical trajectories going all the way back into the 500s. Um, so uh, in, in the AD 500 to 600 range, there were folks in a lot of parts of the Southwest, but there weren't very many in what's now Southwest Colorado. Um, people coalesced into the Northern San Juan region and a population boom uh, followed. So uh, between around 500 to 600, we see big broad similarities stretching from, you know, basically from the south of Chaco up towards, um, you know, Utah, eastward into uh, the area around the upper Animas, Durango, over into northeast Utah. I, I know I'm painting with a really broad brush, but there are, you know, when you take the 30,000 foot view, you can't zoom in on the little tiny details. Um, and that region, the Southwest Colorado region was probably populated by people from, from all of, from the surrounding areas. Um, many settlements at that time in both the Northern San Juan and uh, the San Juan Basin had communities that looked like this one. So uh, this is a shout out to Crow Canyon and the work that they've done in the Basket Maker Communities Project, um, looking at what does a basket maker community, a basket maker community dates to the 500s. That's just a, you know, our, our shorthand term for saying this is a community in the five and six hundreds um, in the northern southwest. And you get these communities with a great kiva, which is a large subterranean ceremonial space, uh, non-domestic. Um, you get these great kivas uh, with a loosely clustered group of habitations around them, often nicely symmetrically, uh, you know, to the north and to the south of them. Um, and you'll see these, this is an example from Southwest Colorado. Um, you could go into parts of Northeastern Arizona, Northwest New Mexico, um, and find similar uh, examples of communities uh, with this particular pattern. Uh, it suggests that there are broad similarities across that, that the region. However, things begin to diverge between Northern San Juan and the, the, the San Juan Basin, beginning around 760. Um, population growth, uh, caused a lot of things, um, and I want to—I don't want to make it seem like population growth was just—it just happened. I mean, I think people were actively trying to have more kids as they're colonizing a space, and I've got a whole other 50-minute lecture about that. Um, the end result is in the northern San Juan, people moved into these dense aggregated villages where, you know, previously one household might have taken up a 60-meter, you know, 130-foot-long amount of space. Now you've got six or seven households crammed into that. And these villages hit a threshold. Like, yeah, there's 100 people crammed into a building. There's 150 people in a community. That does not happen um, at this point uh, elsewhere in the northern southwest. And from here on out, the northern San Juan is sort of on a divergent social trajectory. The kinds of pressures uh, and relations that existed are going to be a bit different. There, there's this big change. Uh, that continued population growth leads to uh, village fissioning, where you know, a village hits a certain point and people are not managing to get along. These villages often split, they fall apart, and some groups of people go off looking for new places. So, um, you know, population growth leads to this fissioning and reorganization. And a lot of these folks, I think they begin trickling down. By AD 840, we might see a few communities moving into the San Juan Basin, where there's already people. So they're looking for these in-between zones. Um, and that this is, this is a reaction, this is a relationship that people have to contend with. There are already folks there. There's new people coming in. How they choose to deal with that's going to have a big effect uh, historically on what the outcome is going to be. Um, I think that one outcome of that could be that these, uh, the, the development of great house communities in the San Juan Basin. The earliest ones seem to date to the 850s, 860s, 870s, at a moment when some people may have been entering these communities from the north. At the very least, uh, you've got the development of great houses in the northern San Juan region, like McPhee Pueblo. You've got great houses down in um, northwestern New Mexico in Chaco Canyon. They're kind of in pure polity territory where it's like they know what's going on up there and they know what's going on down there. Um, 
I think, and there's a, I've got a longer argument for this, but that the development of these in the San Juan Basin is at least partially related to leaders arising and finding ways of dealing with this in potential influx of small numbers of people and saying, where do we put them? Do we form alliances? Do we fight? What do we do? Um, so both places are developing great houses in the late 800s, but in the northern San Juan, um, that is unsuccessful. There's a political crisis. Um, all the villages in the northern San Juan region seem to just have massive disruption. Many are abandoned around 880, 890, and they go other places. Um, here's an example, Klein's Crest. This whole area basically empties out for 20 or 30 years or more, and two-thirds of the folks leave this whole region. A lot of people stay. Um, that's what we're working on with the Haney site, is going, well, what is one of these communities where people stayed turn into in the Chocolate era? To the south, though, the Great House pattern continues. In the north, the house in the south, uh, the Great House pattern continues, and we get scattered across the San Juan Basin um, in the south uh, from 88, 80 to 1050. Um, and I'm glossing over a lot of history here, but basically you can get a lot of great house outlier communities and say, ah, oh, there was a great house like thing here at 920, at 980, at 1020. Um, you can't necessarily say that in a lot of places in the northern San Juan region. There's definite differences between the two places. Not until 1050 are we really able to talk about there being great houses in a meaningful Chacoan way um, north of the San Juan River. And when they do show up, uh, it seems to be kind of a rapid uh, expansion where within the space of a couple generations, great house architecture pops up, um, a Chacoan style great house architecture pops up all over the region. So um, that in a, in a nutshell, the deep history of Chaco to suggest, all right, if we're trying to, when we hit this point at 1050, we've got these two really different areas, um, the south and the north of the San Juan River. There's great houses that typify the pattern to the south. It's not so common to the north, but after that, there are great houses all over the north um, up until from 1050 to about 1140. Um, so we've got these divert these places that are similar at times and they diverge at others and then they, co uh, they coincide again, historically speaking. So I'm gonna give one last little Q&A section here uh, to address some of those questions or other questions before I, uh, I, I motor onward and get into the, the real meat and potatoes of Chacoan landscape change uh, in the Northern Southwest. So if we've got any questions floating around out there, Carrie, I'd be glad to take them. Oh, there's, there's, uh, there's about 20 more questions. So um, how about we just pick one and this one is gonna be, <laughs> um, well, uh, anyway, I'll just ask it and you can see what you think. <laughs> So uh, uh, this person asks, is Chaco a political landscape or a ritual landscape? Is Chaco a political or a ritual landscape? Uh-huh. Let's see. Those things are pretty similar. Um, if you really wanted to parse it out, I would, one way I would look at it, I mean, why is ritual not political? I guess that's what I would throw back. And how is the political not ritual? I mean, if is, a, is like a habitual action that we, we do over and over again. Um, in what ways is having, um, you know, the, the Speaker of the House bang their gavel as all the congresspersons are, are filtering in uh, in the House of Representatives, not a ritual act in a highly politicized um, location. So there are moments when we would look at this and we'd want to talk specifically about what the ritual aspects of that are. Um, there are moments when we would want to talk about the political aspects. I tend to be out of a branch of scholarship that sees the political everywhere. Um, so it really depends for me on what I want to emphasize at any given moment. But I, I see them as being both. You're legitimizing your politics with ritual and your ritual um, and, and in the conduct of your politics, you're, 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 you're doing ritual actions. Um, so that, that's, that's my take on that. Great, thank you. So I think we ought to forge ahead here. Um, this is a new format and I'm still trying to get used to the timing on everything. It's easy to go on tangents when you've got great questions sort of keeping my mind spinning. I've presented the case that we've got these, historically speaking, two really different areas, the North and the South um, in, in the Northern Southwest. Um, and I said, well, if we wanna see change, and that's a kind of scientific study. We wanna see comparison and change over time. Let's compare one that's in the north and one that's in the Chaco and core. So I did uh, my dissertation work at two sites. One of them is Padilla Wash, uh, which is uh, in Chaco Canyon National Park. It's kind of on the far western edge. 
Uh, it's in the, the Aboriginal territory of the, the Pueblo tribes in New Mexico and Arizona uh, and the Diné people in, in Arizona and New Mexico. And I worked at Morris 40 in the north, which is uh, in the, the northern San Juan region. It's on land that is ancestral to and still owned by the Mountain Ute tribe, um, and additionally ancestral to the, the Navajo and Pueblo people too. Um, and I conducted the work in Chaco with the permission of the Park Service. And at Morris 40, I was working with a, a permit under the, the Ute Mountain Ute tribe uh, from Toyoc. So I'm going to walk through the histories of these two communities to talk about their landscape and how they changed to give you a sense of what's it like in Chaco versus somewhere else. So at Padilla Wash, and here's a, here's a bit of a photo of it, um, an overview. It's a, it's a pretty dry, dusty looking place. So I've tried to point out where these features are. This is basically the whole community that I'm talking about here. Um, early in its history, uh, Padilla Wash circa 850 has got eh, five or six big buildings and they're they're not small. There are several pit houses with each of these, but there is a prominent one that's on the kind of the right hand side of your screen that I think qualifies as a proto great house. It has an earthen mound. That's one of those Chaco and landscape features. Um, it has oversized rooms. It's got more pit structures around it than other dwellings in the community, um, suggesting they're cramming a lot of people in there. Uh, it has a trash deposit that seems to suggest massive quantities of cooking or really big cooking pots, the kind of feasting that folks who want to be known as important people tend to do. Uh, and it's got a road segment. Um, it's got a road segment that points to the southeast. Uh, and this road segment um, is discernible in LIDAR data, it leaves uh, the, the Proto Great House, and you can catch another segment of it on some hills to the southeast um, in the LIDAR data set. And when you extrapolate that outward, I think it's actually pointing at one of the uh, a predecessor community. There are not that many um, uh, communities dating to the seven and eight hundreds in this this little area. That's about fifteen kilometers, ten miles across. Um, the South Fork community was occupied from seven fifty to eight fifty. Had a great kiva, had several um, habitation buildings. It was the the biggest thing that came right before Padilla Wash. And so I think that people in that proto great house are explicitly referencing uh, their relationship to that predecessor community at South Fork. Now, um, in the uh, 950s, that proto great house seems to fall out of use. It's not filled with trash or anything, it just falls out of use. Um, and is left there on the landscape kind of as a marker. And a new road segment is built. And at this time, we get the first ceramic evidence that the Great Kiva in the community was built. So I think they're marking, we were over here. Now we have this proto great house. Now the community center is at this Great Kiva um, that's just a short distance to the north. Um, and at that time, uh, several of the buildings are in the community are still inhabited. Um, one of them is beginning to look more like a proto great house type structure with an enc possible enclosed plaza. But it's really at 1020 uh, when things are really kicking up in Chaco Canyon as well, and a lot of the great houses there are constructed. A very clear uh, great house with Chaco style architecture, a kiva that is not entirely blocked in, but kind of elevated and encircled by the great house. Uh, it's got two rectilinear mounds on either side of it, a very clear road segment pointing back towards that great kiva. Um, and shirred berms and little scatters of shirts to the sides of the roads. These are sort of classic Chacoan landscape features. Um, and one of the things that I think is pretty interesting about this layout um, is when you take that road segment outward and you follow it across the valley, it's pointing at the most prominent rock art panel um, in, in the Padilla Wash Valley, about a mile away. And you can see it from, from the spot on the trees out there. Um, now, I'm not going to try to interpret exactly what this panel means, other than to make the statement that we tend to think of rock art panels in very metaphorical terms, um, and I, that's, that's fine, but there are moments when I look at rock art panels and I think of them in very um, explicitly historical terms, and I go, some of these things are marking real events, and people pointing a road segment at this is trying to make reference to potentially those events that are recorded there. Um, these are not, not in my head, some of these are not unlike the stila that you see in Mayan cities where they're saying, you know, this is the person who came in here and conquered this place. I'm not saying this is a panel showing conquering or anything, but going, leaders use ways of recording events um, as ways of aggrandizing and as ways of sort of positioning themselves in the world. 
I think that's what's going on with some of these kind of road segments that point at specific rock art panels. Uh, but he continued uh, for another uh, 25 or 30 years after the 1100s um, with further elaborations. And what really happens is the classic Chaco and community pattern with the great house, with a bunch of small houses around it finally develops. So it's interesting. We often think of great house communities as forming as you know, the great house is there and then all these little houses and households move in around it. What I see at Padilla Blosh is actually that we had a quasi village from the 850s and the 900s with these bigger room blocks, with three or four families in them, maybe, you know, 30 people in each. Uh, and over time, they actually got smaller and smaller until they're single family structures surrounding the great house. So the Chacoan process actually kind of hollows out community centers um, that previously existed. Um, it, it's almost, it, we think of it as aggregation, but in a weird way, it's like a disaggregation uh, of the community. And, and I think that's part of their landscape practice is, is putting the focal point on this particular spot on the landscape and its relationship through time with these road segments to previous versions of the community center. So uh, it, it might be obvious at this point that I'm thinking about Padilla Wash as sort of a quintessential historicizing landscape. So in contrast, let's turn and look at Morris 40 uh, in, the, in the Northern San Juan region. This overview gives you a sense of the landscape there, kind of where the Great House is. The, actually, the community covers this entire area um, and there's about 35 or 40 room blocks through here. Um, it begins at almost the same time as Padilla Wash. Uh, it's got a village segment from the 800s. Um, it is uh, an, a, an aggregated village like the ones in the northern San Juan at 840 uh, to about 880 AD. Um, and one of the unique things about it um, is that there's this rock art panel tucked up a little canyon behind it. Oh, and I don't know if you guys can hear this. If you're in the mountain time zone in Colorado, it's 8 p.m., which means everybody's howling. I guess it's their, their collective action to, to, to stay connected. So if you need to take time to go off and have a howl, uh, I, I totally understand. Um, anyway, so we've got this rock art panel that is, uh, I think, possibly a depiction of the origins of the community. It's hard to make out on here, but there's these linear segments. It's like chunked into little, little rectilinear rectangles all lined up. And in a couple places, there even seem to be people in them. To me, I, it, it just looks a heck of a lot like an archaeologist's view of, of the room blocks. And I don't think it's out of the question that people understood, you know, they, that they were working with two-dimensional media to depict these three-dimensional buildings. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea. I'm going to toss it out there. Um, but at any rate, this panel, which is next to a kind of a water pocket and a spring, uh, is clearly a touchstone for the community uh, and for a variety of reasons. So the if I'm, this picture is me standing at the rock art panel taking a photo to the southeast. You can see there's this little knob of rock. Um, you can see it in the, in the GIS image. And on top of that knob of rock, there are uh, bedrock post holes, which is a common thing in the Pueblo One period. And here I'm highlighting where these little posts are. These would have been the seatings for posts that would have supported a small structure, maybe just one room. I mean, you're already up on that knob. It's not exactly a tower, but it, it's kind of functioning as one. Um, up on that little butte. And there's a hand and toe trail to formalize how you get up there um, to get up on top of this. Now, if you're standing on that butte, and here I am standing like basically where this little butte top room would have been, there's a prominent triangle uh, on the landscape in the distance. It's this butte on the horizon. Well, if you're standing on where I, if you're standing where I took this picture and you're looking at that butte on the winter solstice, you would see the sunrise basically directly over that. I think it, it's a solstice marker showing this is an axis for our community. And in fact, if you trace that line out, it directly splits the community into a north and south half where you've got these dual parts, a north and set part, south part. Um, this starts looking a lot like that balanced dualism we were talking about as being an important landscape feature and the cyclical renewal with, you know, paying, paying close attention to solstitial alignments. For the most part, the community maintains this into the 900s. So where Chaco is going and building great houses all over, there's not really evidence of a great house here at Morris 40 during this time. There is evidence though, that they're continuing to kind of respect these, this north-south divide uh, to a certain extent within the community. And they build a great kiva uh, in the south half of the community, which seems to be sort of a, as we're moving out of a great house phase in the 800s, now we're into a great kiva phase in, in the 900s. 
Now, dramatic changes happen about 1075. Um, you'll notice that there's a, a new community kind of pops up on the southwest, the lower left portion of your screen. Um, there are some big road segments uh, that are in the community, and they, I, to my thinking, they probably date to the time period when um, this new kind of neighborhood went in, when the Great House was constructed. We know this stuff from, from ceramic dates, um, and also because the road segments cut through some earlier structures, and we go, well, you know, that thing was here before this road was built, so we can kind of get a sense of when these roads went in. Um, and so very rapidly, this place shifts from a kind of Northern San Juan style uh, balanced dualism village to this very Chaco style uh, looking community with road segments and a great house. Um, and here's a look at the great house. It's kind of an unassuming lump of, of stone at the moment. Um, there it is right there. But we conducted some remote sensing, uh, some magnetometer survey to get a much better sense. And it actually tells a really interesting story about the history of alignments in this community. Um, so what, what this image shows you is the floor plan of the visible great house. You walk around the top of it, you can see wall alignments and such. Uh, and then all that red and blue and yellow stuff is magnetometer survey showing where uh, underlying things under the surface are. And you see that blob kind of to the north, kind of the northeast of the Great House. It's always been mapped as sort of a, a mound of some stripe or another, but there's clearly something going in there. There's some structure to it. Um, that's another looking right here. And in fact, when I look at this, I think what you're seeing, the, the, you're seeing the outline, the ghost outline of walls from the foundation of an earlier structure um, that existed shortly before this, the current version of the Great House was built. So I'll put that in schematic form. We've got this kind of platform, that big gray thing um, that seems to have been an earlier building, something that was there in the 900s that was broken up and used as fill with a retaining wall to, to elevate that, that great house about a meter or two above the surrounding terrain. The earliest version of the great house is actually directly under that solstice alignment. It's not just in alignment with it, it's like directly under it. Um, but the final version of the Great House um, that you can see today is actually lined up to a minor lunar standstill. That back wall is pointing to a minor lunar standstill. So there is a real clear, um, at first the Great House is built along the axis mundi of the community, but in the second phase, and it's hard to tell how long the distance between those two periods of time was using just ceramics, which is what I was doing, um, at some point, the decision was made, no, we have to take this thing down. We're going to rebuild it uh, in, in a new orientation. Um, this is playing politics with, with landscape. This is trying to align yourself with big things uh, elsewhere in the, in the world because, of course, minor lunar standstills are a very important aspect of, of Chaco and landscape construction in Chaco Canyon. Furthermore, we've got these, these road segments um, outside of the, the Great House. Um, and so the Great House is there, that south neighborhood I've highlighted. Uh, and these roads you can see in the LIDAR extending a good, oh, at least a kilometer and, and some change to the south. Um, and to my mind, what they're really marking is um, both we came from the south and this new neighborhood went in and then this great house was constructed and we're making that link, these sequential links in time. And the ceramics do work pretty well for this, to put them in order and say, came here, then on to the next step. Just like at Padilla Wash, if you extend that line of that road outward, it's actually pointing at the most prominent, um, it's pointing at the most prominent uh, rock art panel in the region, the water flow rock art panel in, in, uh, along the, uh, the San Juan River. You can see this if you're driving by Highway 64 from Shiprock to, uh, to, to Farmington. Um, I almost have a car accident every time, craning my neck to see really cool things there. Um, the road is pointing towards it, and I would love to look for more road segments in the middle, but unfortunately there is a huge coal mine and power plant uh, sitting right across the, the route where that, that road segment would have gone. But on this petroglyph panel, um, an argument has been made by, by Rich Wilshus and, and, and other folks that what we're seeing is a migration panel. It's showing here's a procession of people um, perhaps crossing the river. It is at the river um, at, a, at a fording point of the San Juan. And these emblems, like the one that I've highlighted, um, have been argued by, by, by Rich and others to perhaps be community leader emblems or community emblems. Sometimes you'll see them on rock art panels where there'll be a, an anthropomorphic figure and in their, their head is an emblem that looks something like this. And there's 30 or 40 different versions of these. 
Um, I, I mean, I, I'll leave it to Rich to, to follow up on that, but I think it's a really interesting idea and it fits well with my idea that these roads are often marking rock art panels that are trying to tell a historical narrative and say, this person did a thing at this particular time. Um, I think that would be one way of reading it. So looking at the landscape more broadly, once you've got that road connection to uh, the San Juan River, you're connected by a string of great house communities, basically all the way back along the Chaco Wash to Chaco. So with this road and this rock art panel, Morris 40 is now tied into the Chacoan world um, to some great houses that have existed for several generations. Morris 40 is tapped in. Uh, this is just a little Google Earth view kind of showing you. Uh, and you can see Padilla Wash down there is part of the string of them connected uh, along the San Juan River. It's not like you can, you know, raft this river. There's rarely any water in it, but it is a corridor and potentially a travel corridor. So I think we can look at this and see a real Chacoan transformation at Morris 40. Morris 40 before was a localizing landscape, uh, using my terms, that has evidence of balanced dualism. Uh, it was focused around a solstice. Um, it had springs and rock art showing places of emergence, potentially up this little slot canyon. Uh, but Morris 40, after uh, the Great House is constructed, after 1075, after the Chacoan movement to the north, and we begin to see Great Houses, um, now there are road segments. These road segments seem to be telling time, and they seem to be telling the direction of where people came from. They're using links to petroglyph panels with these roads, uh, and they're creating temporal juxtapositions. Remember that that Great House is built on top of some earlier structure. They didn't leave that there to say, you know, here's, here's an, an older community center. They crushed it up and used it as a platform uh, to put their, their, the new Great House on top of. Um, and then that Great House was, again, the orientation was changed. So here's where I'm going to start trying to stitch together my ball of yarn into a sweater, if I can do that. I've given you a little bit of a case study to try to make the big, broad, abstract ideas I've been batting around explicable. Um, but here's where I'm going to try to bring the pedal to the metal, and hopefully I can wrap this all up. Um, so for recap, here's the big ideas we're playing with. We have this peoplehood model. Uh, that led me to say, well, landscapes would be a thing that archaeologists can look at and might give us some insight into this idea of how do you create a sovereign group of people. Um, when I looked at landscapes, I thought about relational identity and I said, well, you know, people are very linked to these places. When you change the places, you're actually changing the people too. So manipulating landscapes is going to have an effect on the identity, the way a person thinks about themselves. Um, I said, we have to think of it historically. The way it's going to be perceived depends on the history of the region you're in. It's not going to be perceived the same way if you're an outlier community in the north versus the south. Um, and then finally, I gave you this, this model of landscape change. So what were Chacoans up to? And here I'm referring to Chacoan elites, be they high-ranked lineage members, Kiva society priests, both, something else. Um, I'm being a little abstract about that. So cast your mind back to these concepts that I just, I just talked about, that ideas are relationally defined by interaction with the world around them, with places, with things, with other people. Um, in a world where relationships are key, political power is not going to be found solely in economic accumulation. It doesn't really matter if you've got more pots. Um, it's going to be found by inserting yourself into as many relationships, relationships and uh, contexts as you can. It's going to say, well, I'm, I'm part of this society, I'm part of that, I have connections to these places, I have connections to those people. Um, that's what real kind of cultural capital is in this, this world. And power lay in dictating how the world, how these people, places, and things was brought together and, can, and kind of constrained social life. So you can create new contexts and you can manipulate old ones, uh, but this is how power is going to be framed. And for Chacoans, this looked like bringing the world to Chaco. So the timber for those great houses is coming from mountains far away. The stone used for everyday things like flint napping is also coming from important mountain peaks uh, and, and places around Chaco. They're bringing pottery in from some places. They're bringing turquoise. They're bringing jet, shell, macaws from Mexico. Um, but this stuff isn't really part of, you know, a, 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 an economy in the sense. It's not going anywhere. It's all ending up in Chaco. Um, this acquisition implies a connection. And the elites then determined how these items would be reassembled into architectural, economic, and cer ceremonial practices. Uh, but now remember that peoplehood concept. The importance of landscape within the peoplehood model suggests that in terms of creating a shared political identity, a people, 
Geography really matters. Specific places matter. Landscape matters. Orientations matter. So as Chaco and elites related the world to them uh, at large to themselves, they, they didn't do this haphazardly. It's not just sort of grabbing everything that they can. There is a method to this, I think. Um, and this is where we have to remember our history. Once upon a time, uh, the northern and southern San Juan regions seemed to have common practices, ritual practices, community patterns, uh, landscapes, thinking back to those basket maker communities like the Dillard site uh, that I said, there, you can find versions of that uh, across the San Juan Basin. These folks had shared origins, I think, to a certain extent, deep history origins, but shared. Um, but by the 11th century, historical processes had taken these two places further and further apart. In the South, great houses had taken off and maintained their importance into the 10th and 11th century. Uh, pol politics were very hierarchical. Uh, society was organized very hierarchically and landscapes were designed to emphasize the histories of important families. Events mattered and the path of the migration emphasized the knowledge and the power that was gained by those folks over time. To the North, people rejected hierarchy at the end of the 900s as villages failed and the things that come after, well, stay tuned, we'll see what we find with Haney, but um, it seems as if people sort of tried to avoid those kind of hierarchical relations for at least a hundred and something years. Um, the landscapes in the North were very emergent. They were localizing, they were situated in place, they emphasized balance, renewal, and continual emergence into a present in that place. Um, in the 10 hundreds, the Chacoans and the Chacoan Corps see themselves at the center of a web of relations that stretches across the southern San Juan Bay, even southward into polities in northern Mexico. Um, no doubt they were centrally positioned, uh, economically speaking. I mean, all that stuff does end up there, but places matter. Geography matters. Chacoans were decidedly not central from a geographic point of view. Um, this is not a center place yet. As you see, it's kind of, you know, it's at sort of the northeast end of things. And uh, that, that little extension heading up towards Chimney Rock Pueblo, it's even equivocal whether that existed by 1050. Um, that would change things a bit. Uh, in the 10 hundreds, I think Chacoans sought to geographically define Chaco as the center place, as, you know, make themselves central. They shifted their political practice from inserting themselves into existing relations, the ones they had with people in the southern San Juan Basin, they began to cultivate and develop new relations, especially in the North. Um, they had ties going back there two, 300 years before, but uh, nothing, nothing recent. In some places, as they moved North, they built Scion communities where there were no pre-existing uh, communities. They put a great house in a place where it doesn't seem like anybody was there before. I think Salmon Pueblo is a good example of this from what I hear. Um, but in most places, there were already people living there. You know, there's, the Northern San Juan was not empty in the nine and the 10 hundreds. And these places, and this is like Morris 40, uh, Chacoans encountered existing communities. So to relate these places to Chaco, Chacoans reconfigured their landscapes to correspond to the principles and practices uh, with the core. That is, they constructed historic landscapes like at Morris 40. They added roads that told histories. They created architectural juxtapositions between the old community buildings and the new they hollowed out community centers and reshaped social organization into the great house pattern we recognize. We see that at Morris 40, just like at Padilla Wash. This seems to be part of the chalk one thing is hollowing out this core uh, and pushing people into single household dwellings uh, around the community. And that's what we recognize as a great house pattern. But that's just the final product. You know, that's, not, that's not the process of getting there. So, Chacoans subverted local landscape practices that oriented people to their own histories, their own emergence places, their own, their own, their own histories. Uh, and they reordered these uh, landscapes into the larger Chacoan landscape. The changes to the landscape rewrote those histories. They reoriented community, community ceremonialism. I wish there, I would love to know about the effect it had on language. So in the idiom of peoplehood, changes to the landscape resulted in changes to the people. Chacoans were using people as resources that could be mobilized and reassembled into new configurations that resembled Chaco. In their quest to relate the world to Chaco on Chacoan terms, uh, the Chacoan elites created a condition of peoplehood throughout the Northern Southwest. The manipulation of landscapes within Northern San Juan communities was a political act. Uh, it was designed to increase Chaco's prominence uh, within the web of relations that existed. This expansion actually has all the hallmarks of early state builders in other parts of the world. Reorient people's relationship um, to the world around them, to their things and their places, their own communities, reorient them in order to bring them into a growing state. Now, 
I'm not sure that domination was the goal for Chacoans. I think that the goal was increasing the density of their relations with the known world, bringing things into relation with Chaco. It is for this reason that I say, for a brief period, and if you give me some you know, poetic license here, Chaco was an accidental empire. Uh, the landscape practices they employed to relate outlying communities back to the center had the unintended consequence of bending the people towards them as well. In the early 1100s, Chaco found itself at the center of a growing polity founded not on economic extraction, but on the creation of these historicizing landscapes. But there is actually kind of an irony to this. Um, if you take a relational view, this 30,000 foot perspective and you start thinking, all right, so it looks like this from Chaco. What's it look like out here at the outliers? There's a big contradiction here um, in what I've been telling you. The same events can look really different depending on where you're standing. From Chaco, it looks like they're building a giant emergent localizing landscape at a regional scale. Um, whereas from a great house in an outlier community, it looks like um, your emergent landscape, your localizing landscape was being ripped apart by this historicizing one that's trying to bend your history, your language, your ceremonies back towards Chaco and its particular history ceremonies uh, and so forth, its conditions of peoplehood. So contradictions require resolution. And I suppose that Chaco could have so completely overcome the, uh, sort of completely altered the identities of outlier residents so that there would be no coming back. Uh, and they would have created greater economic and social centralization over time. This is how states develop. Instead, I think Chaco failed under the way of this contradiction. Um, local communities resisted Chaco and landscape practices and reasserted their autonomous landscapes. Uh, and by 1140, the pan-regional condition of Chaco and peoplehood seems to, to be dissolving a bit, at least in the north. Um, we can see this really well at Morris 40, where one of the last acts the community uh, in the 1140s or 1150s seems to be a rejection of the Chacoan landscape uh, and kind of reconsecrating it on new terms. The road segment that was sort of the umbilical heading back towards Chaco and all those aspects of Chacoan history, uh, the rock art panels, the outlier communities along um, the, the Chaco wash, um, was blocked by a great kiva. Um, the first great kiva built in this community for probably 150 or 200 years. Um, a, a great kiva was plopped right across this road segment, blocking it. The great house has this little addition made kind of right up on the tippy top out of a totally different masonry style, as do several other buildings in the community. It's almost like, you know, there, there's the foundational level, there's this Chaco and thing, and then we're going to put this new version with new masonry style and sort of re reconfigure what this building is meant to do. At the same time, um, a aggregated dwelling is constructed. You can see it sort of just to the, uh, the left of where that circle where the Great Kiva is. It's southwest of the, the Great House. Um, it's, uh, it's the first time an aggregated dwelling is built in this community for a couple hundred years as well. This is a return to old ways uh, and explicitly blocking the Chacoan connection, um, which I think is telling and saying this is how people living here felt about what this landscape meant. So kind of to bring it to conclusions, um, Chacoans sought to gain power by creating and manipulating their place within the relations of the ancestral Pueblo world. In doing so, they altered landscapes, which dramatically altered people's identities, and they briefly created what I called kind of an accidental empire. Uh, if historical circumstances had been a bit different, maybe this story would have gone another direction, uh, but it didn't. Uh, by the middle 1100s, Chaco was no longer the central place of importance that it, it may once have been. Um, so what does this history mean for us? And I kind of was just thinking how to wrap this up and what would be, you know, what's my takeaway on this? Um, what I've got here is that the political landscapes of the past, these Chaco and political landscapes that tell the story of, of how Chaco brought these places into, um, into relation with it, um, these political landscapes of the past intersect with our political landscapes in the present. Um, now, the analysis of this would be different, looking at the landscapes of the present. Our ball of yarn in the contemporary world is knitted up really differently. We'd probably choose different methods, but I think the underlying message holds true. Uh, we think an awful lot about how we change the landscape. Um, we should be thinking about how the landscape changes us, too. And so what I've got on the screen here, um, all these maps I've presented to you of, say, Morris 40, I had kind of extracted out all the historic and the recent levels, uh, all, the, all those parts of the landscape too. I've added in the well pads that are in the, the hashed, kind of hashed checkered areas. I've added in the road segments to the well pads, the pipelines that cut through things, the berms and stock driveways and stock tanks. 
Um, so we can see that this is a living landscape. People are still um, interacting with it, still forming relationships with it. Um, and it's very easy when we do this Chaco and research to forget how our contemporary landscape continues to intersect with this. Um, I'm not sure what it would look like, but I think for me, the takeaway is that we think an awful lot about how we change the landscape and our effects on it, but we should be spending some time thinking about what effect those landscape changes are having on, on us too. So that wraps up what I had. I'm sorry, this went a little bit about 15 minutes longer than I was aiming. That's probably the Q and A, but I figured you're all sitting at home. For all I know, you've gone off and used the bathroom and grabbed a second beer or whatever you're gonna do. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now and I'm sure I've seen the little ticker hitting here. There's gotta be a dozen questions lined up. I will try to take uh, as many of those as I can. We probably won't get through all of them. Hopefully Carrie has had a chance to maybe kind of say, all right, we got three along the same lines. Let's, let's take a crack at it. Yeah, there's actually 35 questions. So I'm only gonna tell you a few of them. <laughs> all right, all right. Because that seems like a lot. Okay. Um, all right, there was a good one back here. Okay, this one, this is a Tim Kohler question, uh, Kellum. How and why do the Chacoan people from the southern um, San Juan Basin expand into the northern San Juan? Okay, how and why? Well, I, I, as I laid it out there, I think for me the motivations are what I said, they're trying to bring places into relation with Chaco, and part of that is through sending people up who, I suspect in the in, in the Pueblo idiom, it would be they're creating buildings and potentially kivas with ceremonies that are meant to relate back to the ones that are going on in Chaco. I don't see this as like a whole scale population replacement. In fact, I would see it as, you know, that neighborhood that I highlighted in Morris 40 that may be built by people coming in from the south. Um, we're probably not talking about more than uh, you know, 50 people or something like that. So I think it's small numbers, not enough to dramatically affect. You know, it, we don't see the contrasts of those population movements because one, um, the material culture aspects of identity are for, for this kind of political identity seem to be less important. And that's one conclusion I draw from peoplehood. Uh, second is that they were never that different to begin with. As I've said, these are people with common historical origins. So I suspect, and this is just from now, you know, I kind of came up with this model when I was doing my dissertation work. Now I'm working at Crow Canyon. I am uh, working on the Northern Chaco Outliers Project. I have access to a bunch of different information and I'm starting to think about this differently. Um, I suspect there is gonna be more nuance as you look at different communities. Haney might not prove to be like this. So far, I've been having a hard time finding the road segments. Part of that is, um, you know, the, the landscape has been significantly plowed in a way that it hasn't in the, in the south of the San Juan Basin. Um, but it might look a bit different. But I still think that the movement is, um, you know, we're not talking thousands of people. We're talking dozens, you know, a dozen coming into a community, um, 40 people coming into a community. Great, thank you. There's a number of questions that are related to the roads, the road okay. segments. Um, a, a couple of them relate to like, what are the things on road segments? Someone asks if there's her heraduras on the road segments and other people are asking how you identify them. They're not paved, are they? So talk a little bit more about how one ident identifies those archeologically. Yeah, let's see, I can try to scoot back a couple of, a couple of slides. Archeologically road segments are most evident as um, what we'd call a swale, a, a low spot in the ground. And I feel like I've got a good slide back here somewhere and it's got the LIDAR data. Um, there we go. So you can kind of see that. That is showing us that somebody cleared the ground for about six to eight meters across and they formed berms on either side. Sometimes those berms are incidental just for moving the earth out of the way. Other times they are um, you know, actively constructed and they might have sherds in them. Um, some are very, very obvious. Like when you're walking along one at Morris 40, the berm is as high as your head. Uh, you're, it's pretty clearly in a road segment. Others, as you can see, the southernmost extensions of this kind of peter out and they intersect a, a, an oil and gas road. Um, and so LIDAR has been one technique that people have used. That's, um, it's, a, a, it's based from an airplane shooting little laser beams down basically and recording the, I think it's the distance in the, length of time it takes for it to hit and return. Um, it can give you an accurate map within five or so centimeters of the ground surface. So these really subtle ones will show up that way. Um, 
Yes, there are features that often are found with roads, either burned patches. Um, it's not entirely clear what those are for yet. Huraduras are C-shaped circular shrines. I actually haven't found any at Padilla Wash or at, um, at Morris Fort yet, although I have not done a large scale landscape level survey. I haven't walked all of the terrain along these roads. Um, so those are ways that we identify them. Um, they do fall into pretty typical patterns. And what's interesting to me is that these things existed from about 850 or 900 up until maybe 1250 in some places, and then that is it. There are trails, there are important trail segments in the contemporary Pueblo world, but the, the road segments like this seem to fall out of practice. Um, they're not marking these kinds of relationships as clearly uh, in the physical environment. Great, thank you. Um, there are a couple of, sort of environmental questions. One that asks about how uh, climate would have impacted people uh, changing um, where they were living on the landscape, and then what was the landscape like in the past when people were living at places like Padilla Wash? So okay. a little bit of environmental. Yeah, if you well, so Padilla Wash, there's really different um, agricultural potential at Padilla Wash versus Morris Forty, um, and that's true of the northern southwest or the northern San Juan and the San Juan Basin. Um, at Padilla Wash, agriculture seems to be focused around dune fields and potentially some floodwater farming and there are seep springs as well um, and so from an environmental perspective for agriculture that's one of the important parts of it. it um, the Chaco wash has always got something in it. You can dig, Tom Wines tells me, you can go places out on the Chaco wash which is just about a mile beyond Padilla wash uh, and you can dig a 30 centimeter deep hole and you'll find water even in fairly dry years and maybe a little more than 30 centimeters. Um, Morris 40 is actually situated along what could have been a seasonal or even perennial small water course. Um, and the community clusters around a series of where there used to be springs. Um, some of them have gone dry, but the old name for the site was Cottonwood, uh, the Cottonwood Great House, because there used to be cottonwoods right there, um, right below the Great House. Um, so it's a, I mean, you can farm on the, the kind of barren slopes and the barren looking slopes around it, but I suspect that some of it might have been down along that water course as well. Um, yeah, it's true. I have not, I, it's not that I have not considered environmental change. It's that I have focused on discussing the um, social and political aspects of these landscapes uh, in my work. Now, um, I think in each of these, we have to see the political crises that I characterized as being part of the late 800s and the early 900s. And again, in the 1140s, um, these are definitely exacerbated by significant downturns in the regional climate where it's, um, I call them political crises though, because it's like, well, some people managed to keep living there. There was, you know, you didn't, the place did not have to be completely abandoned. The real problem was finding ways to overcome those challenges, and in some cases people did, and in other cases people did not. Um, that could certainly have played a role in the kind of the final downturn here in the 1140s in, in, in the Chacoan period at Morris 40. That said, at Padilla Wash, that community was already, um, maybe declining is the wrong word, but people were moving out of it into other places by 1125 before that big drought even struck. So some of the changes happening in Chaco are internal changes. They are issues with how they are organized. They are contradictions that have arisen um, based on some seed that was sown long ago uh, are, are rising up here. And then you compound that with a drought, that's gonna be a problem. So that, that's kind of how I approached environment uh, in a lot of my work as um, it is one of the changing parts of the physical environment that is going to affect people. Uh, but it might, for me, it's not always the prime mover. Great, thanks, Kellum. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do just one more, one last question that is a, a relatively easy one, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Aletta wants to know if you plan to publish your dissertation as a book. Oh, um, I'm hoping to. Yeah, I would like to. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I have a very hard time boiling, as you've seen, as you know, thank you for those of you who are sticking around for this at the end here. Um, I have a hard time boiling my stuff down. <laughs> I see all the parts is related. And I'm like, I can't tell you this part of the story without, you know, back in the Maya scene, uh, something happened. So um, my hope is to do this as a book because I feel like it is a book length idea. But knowing what, uh, knowing how presses work and, and that kind of thing, 
probably won't see that for four or five years. <laughs> um, but thank you for asking. Great. Well, thank you so much, Callum. This was really wonderful. And um, I'm really glad that we got, we didn't answer about 20 of the questions that, that came up, but I did take some screenshots. So I'll share them with you, Callum. And maybe, you know, if you have a little bit of time over the next few days, you can think about answering a few more of them. Yeah. And maybe what I'll try to do with that is, I don't, I don't know if we have a way to post this somewhere through Crow Canyon, but I can, you know, try to tackle each one of them and, and maybe, you know, some will be longer than others and we can put them all somewhere. And if you had a question that didn't get answered, um, we'll see. Stay tuned on that. I don't want to make any promises I can't yeah. keep. That'd be great. Thank you, Callum. Thank you. And all right, thank thanks you very all much, for... everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate you. And, uh, you know, this final page here is really just my thank you to, you know, I act like I did this alone in my little tweed jacket sitting here, but it takes a village to talk about villages and to research about villages. And, um, you know, a lot of people were involved in this, actually, and I, I want to thank them. I just would not, I wouldn't be here doing this, but weren't for everything on this screen. Uh, right now. And, and thank you to the Hisatsanam chapter of, of Colorado Archaeological Society and to Crow Canyon uh, for, for figuring out how to host this. Carrie, I spelled your name wrong on the slide. That's embarrassing. Oh, I'm That's sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> I just noticed when you pointed that out too, though, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Right. I hope you had a thank good night. Thank you. Thank you.